Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's John Smith. I'm going to talk to you about Entity Framework Core. Um, in the middle of 2016, I got an email out the blue uh, from Manning saying, uh, I, I see you've, um, you've blogged a lot about EF6. Would you like to write the book on Entity Framework Core? Out the, view, out the blue, massive job. Um, I really enjoyed it, and I learned a lot. And then afterwards, um, I went back to c contracting, um, and people tended to ask me to do very difficult things with Entity Framework Core because of the book. So I've had experience uh, of doing it in the wild. So what I tried to put together is a whole load of different things. I, I don't know what you know. So I've just kind of put a whole load of things that I think are useful and possibly not known by people. And I'm hoping that you're something, you're something you'll go, I didn't know that, that's useful, right? So I've got a whole splatter of stuff. Can I ask how many people are using EF Core now? Most, but not all. Okay, so um, I'm going to go deep, but it's about deep about how it works inside. So if you haven't used EF Core before, you should get out some something out of it. But some of the things might go over your head. But it's really I'm just trying to tell you how it works inside and how you can use that. So I'm going to. This is my. One page expla explaining everything about EF Core. Well, not really. Um, EF Core is an object relational mapper, and it maps classes. You can see these, are they blue in there? No, they're not very blue, are they? Anyway, that you can see the, the, the two classes at either side, and it maps those to tables or views in the database. Um, the database I'm going to do a bit of demo on is... Um, Really simple. Uh, you've got a, set, a book which had a one-to-one -one to an author. And just to make it interesting, I've got four books, but the first two have the same author. OK? So um, if you haven't come across EF Core before, it works out, um, EF Core works out what the database looks like by looking at how you've built your class. And there's certain... Um, um, standard uh, uh, default ways of doing it by uh, using names, but there's a load of configuration you can put in. If you want to start with a database, there's a method to reverse engineer that and build the classes and all the configuration to fit. Okay? So there you are. Um, you can see most of the properties are mapped to the columns in the tables. There is one here that isn't. That's called a navigational property, and a lot of the power of EF Core lives in its navigational properties, as we'll see in a minute. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take you into uh, EF Core and back out. So we're start, starting at 9 o'clock. That's the code, and we'll, we'll go around. We'll do it in stages. So the first thing it does, um, when you call to list on that, uh, with the context on the beginning, it says, OK, I, I can understand this. You've got a property in your context called books, which, which is mapped, mapped to the books table. And you want to include the author for that book. Right? And Tudor says do it for all the whole database, which is four books. <laughs> uh, translated, um, obviously that's easy, but some aren't. It's, it's then uh, cached. Um, and then it hands over to a database provider. There are a number of database providers. Um, SQL Server, um, SQLite, PostSQL, uh, PostgreSQL, MySQL are there. Um, there are others you can pay for and some other um, that are um, for don't work with three yet, which is the uh, recent release. So the database providers job is to um, format the 
the SQL because there's slight differences be, between each database um, and handle all the interactions with the database. And so in this case, it sends out the uh, select command that, that um, your uh, query created and then it gets the data and it sends it back to EF Core. And it goes through three things. I hope you can see this at the back. There are, it creates the classes. So it creates four books and three authors. Okay. Then it does this thing called relational fix-up. Um, some magic here. So what it says, I know, I've loaded those. I know all about their priority keys. Uh, and, and foreign keys, I, I understand that. And it then looks for any uh, relational um, uh, navigational properties. The, the, one, the author one I showed you in the uh, book, and it goes, oh, I better fill that in. So it then uh, makes a reference from this book to its author. And you notice that the first two books go to the same author. And then it does something called tracking snapshots. So it takes a copy of what's out there and keeps it. It's kind of, you can get to it, but it's inside the context. You, you know, it's kind of hidden a bit. Um, and why is that there? So EF Core is trying to um, be good about doing its updates. So if you, say you picked the first book and wanted to change its title, all you would do is you, you would take the first book and you would assign a new um, title to the title property. And then you call this mega um, method called save changes. And it, um, EF Core will then look at everything that it's tracking, right, and go, ah, oh, um, what, what's happened? And in, these, in this case, it will know that it's pulled those in, they're not new, um, and you haven't deleted them. So it goes, oh, I better compare these one by one against all of these um, tracking snapshots. And it, uh, it goes to book one and goes, oh, the title's changed. It goes through all the rest, no, nothing else. So at the end, it, it says, oh, the only thing I need to do is do a, a, a one-line update um, title for book one, right? And that's what uh, it happens. Now, um, there's a couple of things to say here. One is, if you're just reading this to display to your users, you don't need this. And there's a command called um, as no tracking, which turns this off. So it's a little bit quicker and a little le less um, memory being used. But I need to tell you something. In before three, if you had as no tracking, it would still do this, four books, three authors, all the links. In three, they fixed, well, they changed um, as, uh, as no, tra no tracking. It had got some problems and they needed to do it and they also wanted to speed it up. And the, the speed up is now, it will return four books and four authors, two of them will have duplicate data in it, right? So that's not a problem when you're going to the front end, but if you're in your business logic and you wanted to read something in and, and kind of traverse all the, the relationships, as no tracking will could change those relationships. Okay, so just be aware of that. Okay, that's a simple, uh, I used a very simple um, database to show you that. Let's go and look at uh, something a bit more complicated. So in, in my book, I build a super simple um, Amazon site, right? Um, and uh, there's a number of reasons I, I picked on this. We, we understand books and reviews and things like that, so it's not alien. But also, I could have one of each of the sort of database um, type uh, relationships. So we know a book can have um, multiple authors, and authors can have 
write multiple books, so you have to have a many to many. Uh, the reviews, you can naught to many of those, that's a one to many. And I had kind of had to work at having a one to one. This is uh, the idea is the, pr it, the price is what's in there unless this is one of those is there. So, yeah. But, anyways, so um, that's the database. But the, the, the user of my site is re not really interested in that. They want to see a display. And to build that, it's not trivial. So the title's easy. The, author, the, the authors, there may be multiple authors, and it has to go through the table and fill all that out. But the one, ones that get interesting is working out the average, uh, I called it votes, not stars. Don't want, don't want to Amazon coming after me. Um, by two customers. Um, and I'm going to show you now some different ways you could build that and what the performance of those are, OK? So if you go to, uh, what's it say? Loading related data uh, page on the EF Core doc um, site, it will list these three ways of loading. Uh, <coughs> e e eager loading you've seen. Explicit loading is, I loaded the book. I forgot to lo load the reviews, so I'll load it now. That sounds silly, but you can imagine top level, someone loads a book, uh, the business logic needs that. There's a way to get to it. And then lazy loading is, um, if you put virtual and I think you put a library in, the, um, what happens is if you've got a book and you don't read this, nothing happens. But if you read it, it goes, ah, he needs that. I'll pull that in from the database, OK? Now, there is another way called select loading, which I use quite a lot. And um, it allows you to pick exactly what you want, but it's still, you can still access um, the uh, relationships that, that are there quite easily. So you're not losing anything. Um, and I, let's see, look at the timings. So select loading wins slightly over eager loading. But I want you to see this. Right? Um, and it's all about trips to the database. Um, uh, let me, yeah, let me go back. This is, this is 3 1. If I go back to um, before 3. Uh, there were more commands in here. There's a big change, many of you will know this, that they've, they've done a massive change to the, the way they handle uh, turn link into SQL. And before three, if you loaded a book and then you loaded the reviews, they were done by separate SQL commands. Right? So uh, this, these two would be like this two, this I think there's three in here and four in here. Uh, so there's four commands, but it's all done in one database trip. Um, and um, these are about 20% faster than 2-1. Uh, um, but so I can say it's not about how many commands you don't do. It's how many trips to the database you make is, is going to hit you. And I call it, a very, you know, if this is a very chatty. This is very chatty. And it not only will hit the performance here, it will put more load on your database. And I'll, I'll talk about seeing that later. Um, so you just got to be aware of that. Um, and um, lazy loading, I get pulled in to look at performance. And lazy loading is really easy to use. And the problem is it, it spreads lots of chatter across your database. Sorry, if, but it's really easy to use. And, and a lot, especially, say you've got a repository and you're using this query to do in three or four places, and you now need to add reviews. You don't really want to add it to what's there, it might break something else, so you'd, you use lazy loading. I understand that, 
but you're going to get more database trips. Um, so um, let me look at the select loading. Um, so this is the select loading to build that. Looks horrible, and I'll um, break it down. Um, but um, it's not as bad as you think, because by the end of running this, it's done everything, right? What you would have had to do with the other ones, and I had to do um, for the test, is you had to pull in all the, the reviews, then you had to get, count them, then you had to do the average, then you had to check whether there was a promotion and all that sort of stuff. It's all done in here. Um, the benefits of this, you will see in a minute, but I want to... Oh, uh, yeah, so you notice I've... This, I just want to focus on this bit. If I put in reviews.count, reviews EF Core goes, I can do that in SQL, right? So it never has to re, uh, load the reviews. This one, getting the average, that, that was really hard to work out. I had to ask Git, uh, um, the team on GitHub. You have to put a double, um, nullable dub, double there. And why is that? It turns out it's because the average, um, most of the um, aggregate commands in the database, like sum, average, max, min, if there's no data, they turn, return null. Right. So you have to make it. You have to have a double because this is a, this is a byte, and, and that won't average, will it? <laughs> um, so, but um, that's why you need the nullable. Um, and bef before three, if you got it wrong, it would do it, but it would do it all in, in the, it would pull stuff in multiple times into the software and do it there. And it was terrible performance, right? And I knew about that it, um, really on, early on in the book. And, and I just warned people about that. But... I think it, um, the team must have seen that there's just terrible performance. So in three, if you, do, if you didn't put that in, you'd get, I can't handle this, right? It'll just kick it out. So um, I think that's better, but I've I would imagine anybody that's converted from two to three might have had a few queries that broke. I don't know, anybody? <laughs> anyway, my client did. <laughs> that's why he hired me. Um, so anyway, if you do this, again, that average will be done in your database. So I'm going to say, don't, don't try and read that. I'm going to give you a bigger site. Sorry. But I just want to say that um, EF Core, that, this is taken from a information logging from EF Core. And if you're using normal dev sit, uh, system, it will appear for you. And it, it produces really readable SQL. Now, I know you're using EF Core because you don't want to go anywhere SQL, near SQL, right? But when it comes to performance, sometimes it's, be, it's good to be able to look at that. Now, I tried the same thing on EF6, and it was 100, 118 lines, and it was completely impenetrable. It was, you couldn't read it. This, you could pick up. Um, you'd have to replace that with a, an ID and run it somewhere and just see what's going on. So I'm just saying it's, um, it, you most likely don't want to go near SQL, but when your performance starts kicking in, this is what you can do. Um, I just want to... Look at this. This is the, the count, and this is the av. So doing the average in the database. So um, I I didn't I didn't want to skew things. If I had to put in a hundred, um, I only had ten reviews to average and count. If I'd put in more, the timings would be more apart. But this is a very special. Thing. So I'm not trying to say that, you know, select is 
always going to be way better anything, than anything else. This is a particular case. But what I, what I would say is um, in this book, there's a, a description. And normally, that would be very big. And if you were using include or anything else, it would load that, and you ne don't need it. In a select load, you can leave that out. Again, in the test I did, the, the, the description was like 10 characters, so it didn't really ha make any difference. Um, the only problem with select loading is that they're hard to write. So I just want to point out, I bet most of you know about Automapper, right? It's uh, um, been around for years, and uh, it's an object-to-object um, mapper, so it will map things from one class to another class. But it will also produce a link. So um, there's a command project to, which instead of copying things, it will create the link that will do the copy. right? And so, for instance, if... Um, this is my, I call it a DTO, view model, whatever. It's just a, the thing that I want to go to. If you put author name, um, and there's something called author, and, something, uh, and it's got a, a, a property called name, um, Automapper will automatically work out that. And the same with po post count. For this complicated thing, you would have to tell it directly what it to do. But Automapper, I use a lot. Um, it's, it's a really good library. It's well supported. I think the document, documentation is quite hard work. But um, anyway, that, that will help you um, if you want to use select queries. OK. So we've, we've read, read things from the database. So now we're going to talk about pushing things out to the database. And in my... Um, book, I've got my one-to-one, -one, my one-to-many, and my many-to-many -many relationships. And I've decided I want to create a new book with an existing order, uh, author. Okay? So this is one way of doing it. You create the book, you save it, you get the primary key, and you fill in the... This, this linking table has to have these... Um, foreign keys filled in, okay? So that's one way to do it. Uh, the problem, I don't mind setting up relationships with, um, by setting foreign keys, but I do have a problem with two safe changes. So the problem with that is that you've got a book that is incomplete, hasn't got an author, right? Um, you save it, and then you, something goes wrong here, and this doesn't happen. At that point, you've got a book which might break your system, right? So you want to, you don't want to do, have two save changes like that. So in my um, systems, I get everything ready, and I call one save, save change. And um, just for people that don't know, um, save changes does all this kind of clever stuff, but then anything it saves, it saves within a transaction. So either it all works or none of it works, right? So if you can't do it that way, how can you do it? Well, these navigational properties. So here is a, another version, um, and... You may not re realize, but here, we're doing something to the author link. That's a navigational property. When it, when it goes and looks, it says, oh, that's changed. And it will say, oh, all right, I'm, oh, it's a new book author, right? That's not in the database. Oh, I, I better add that too. And then in the book author, I, set, I just set the author. Um, this is the navigational property with the author that I've loaded. And then I can call save changes just once. So let me, let's go through this because it's interesting how EF Core does that. So the red things are new. The blue thing is there already. So I've run all my codes, but I haven't called add or save changes. 
So I, the link's in there. You can see that there's no primary key in here and there's no uh, foreign keys in there. When you call add, it does a couple of things. I don't know what order, um, but it fills in any um, foreign keys that are needed. It's, it, it knows from the links what you want, and it fills in the foreign keys. So the, the, this one was easy. It said, oh, oh I'm, looked at, I'm linked to that. Oh, oh it's, it's already got a key. Right, OK, I'll fill it in. When it comes to this one, it goes, oh, no, I haven't got that yet. So it fills it with a, um, both the book ID, primary key in the book, and the foreign key in the book author with a, the same large negative n number. Um, before I go on, EF core change, uh, uh, EF core three change, before three, it did put it in the properties in your classes. Now it puts it in the, the uh, snap, uh, tracking snapshot. There's reason for that, but anyway. So the, you wouldn't see that um, after you'd done add. It would be hidden. And then, when you go save changes, it works out which order to write things out and sets it up. I'm going to show you the sequel for that in a minute. Um, and then what it does, when it's done all that, it, it will copy any changes that happened in the database back into your classes so that they are an exact co correct against the database. And, it, and they go to the state of, un, of unchanged. Um, I'll see, show you the SQL. So it puts the book out. This command gets the primary key and then uses it to create the book author. That's a very simple example. I had a, a multinational client who had got two security systems, um, the new one and an existing one, and they wanted to link them. And we came up, uh, they didn't really want to t touch the existing security system. So I built a, uh, an application. I did reverse engineered the main, um, the, the existing database so that I could access it, right? And the new system would send me events. And I had to build really complex um, set of things, pulling that from that database, de de deleting that, adding that. And there were about 15 classes. And I'm, I changed relationships. I changed, I, I added things, uh, new um, classes to it. I removed classes from it. Um, I changed things, and then uh, even the, um, the, the project manager, who is a quite um, uh, techie, said, don't you have to write them in the right order? I said, no, EF Core will do that. So I just send all this mass back to EF Core, and it works out everything. And it does it in the right order, put it in, in the right place, and it just works. And it, that, for me, is, is fantastic. I'm going to talk very briefly about domain-driven design. Domain-driven design talks about when you're doing your business logic, your, your business logic should not really know anything about the database. And because of the way EF Core works, it, it, it can do that. You can use all these navigational links and never touch primary keys, foreign keys, never look at them, and your, data, your business logic um, can work as if it's just an in-memory set of classes. There's a few little things that you have to give it a, to help it. I agree. If you add something you, you know, that, or, or delete something, there's a, some things you need to do. But in general, it makes your business logic really easy to work on. OK. OK, let's keep going. So um, I just wanted to come back to this um, because there's something going on that is, um, I think, is quite interesting. So we know, we've seen this right at the beginning. If you did that, they're all linked up nicely. But did you know if you loaded the books and then loaded the authors, 
they'd also end up linked. So you have to understand that, uh, that when, you, um, when you load anything, so this, uh, this is, say this is the first thing, and now it's tracking those books, right? Then um, you, the next thing you load, it will look at everything that it's tracking, and it will say, should I be linked to this? And then it will fill in those links. So it's amazing. You know, you, you can pull this in and pull that in, and it will go, ooh, and it will link it all up. Right? Now, I was putting this uh, talk together over Christmas, and I'm working for a client at the moment, um, and we had just... We knew we had a problem with... Um, showing a job, I, I won't go into the details, but, and it was, uh, they'd got a big, but not the biggest job, and it took nine seconds to display. That's not going to be good, right? And it was, it was all about um, hierarchical data. I, I seem to do a lot with hierarchical data, and hierarchical data is really hard to um, performance tune. Um, and I'd got a method where I... I pulled in the first three with, by going parent, include children, then include children. And then I had to do, down here, I, I did explicit loads. So it's very chatty. And I thought, I'm, t I'm saying all this thing about the cleverness of the link of um, relational fix-up. Can I get that to work for me? And yes, I can. So if I... I, all these blue things have a job ID. If I load them just with one uh, child, all these relationships are set up. Um, you know, I just get them all in. I have to find the parent by saying, you know, it's not, there's no, um, um, it's parent ID is null, yeah? But it, it fills it all in. So that radically changes my uh, software. We did quite a lot of other things as well. I'm not saying only this, but uh, by doing that, I re reduced loads of database access accesses to three really big accesses that pulled things in, and a small one that I couldn't avoid. And um, the whole thing went down from nine to under two seconds. And um, the problem is not this now. It's the, the problem always was, with, um, to put this information on the um, display, we needed this, but there were about six other very um, big queries going on as well, all in parallel. And the chattiness of that was, you know, there's so much hitting that database, it was slowing everything down. So this took uh, a lot of the chattiness out, um, and now the problem is still the other ones are a bit chatty, right? And we can, but we're in a good place now, so we're, we're, we're happy. Um, so yeah, it's it's ticks, uh, tricks like this that um, can help you um, make your systems run better. Right, I'm going to do domain-driven design in five minutes. Impossible. <laughs> I came across uh, domain-driven design in 2012, uh, and I, I, I've had a really interesting career. I was a developer. I, be, uh, I was the manager of, um, of developers and tech di director and everything, and I came back to programming. And this book just spoke to me, because I, I'm used to talking to customers and developers and writing code. Um, and I love it, but I would say it's taken me quite some time to get a feel for the right ways to do it. Um, so I recommend it um, and do get into it, but it's, um, you know, you're going to pick where you start. I, all I want to cover is that the, if you want to make your classes, your EF core classes, um, uh, um, follow the standard that DDD talks about, um, which is 
all the properties and all the collections should be read only. Um, you should have a, the, the public constructor should have, you know, you, it would only create a valid book. You know, it would have um, title, price, blah, 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 and authors. So the idea is that you can never create something in here that is invalid. It, and it's, it, it's a job of this class to keep it valid. And so in, if you want to change anything, you have to go through va um, methods to change things because th then the class can always keep itself valid. Um, all I want to talk about is how you could make a class, lock down the class, so that you could do DD. So, of course, you can set the, um, the private setters there, which will stop, you know, anybody a accessing any of those. But when it came to the collections, um, if you had a collection, you can still add or remove from it. And the way around it is by using backing fields. Anybody use, using backing fields? I, I use them a lot. They're really good. So what backing field says is, and this is an EF core thing, um, you've got a field here, private field, and it will read and write to that. Uh, in EF core three, that is the default setting. Before, before three, it wasn't, but now it is, and that's the, the best thing to do. So it reads and writes to that. And then you give something to the, if someone look, needs to get to the reviews, you, you, uh, you give it something which uh, it can't change. This is the recommended way by Arthur Vickers, who's the top man at EF Core. You put an I in enumerable, so you can't add and remove from that. And you also take a copy of the reviews to send back. So even if you cast it, you can't get back to the data, right? And then you have an add review command, and you're going to have a re remove review and, and update review and all sorts of things in there. All I wanted to, to, uh, to talk to you about is about how you would set up your class to be DDD. I, I'm, you know, that's all I can do in this time. <laughs> right? Okay. Um, I just, this is the kind of things I've come across that you, you might know about some of them, but I, I think they're useful. So um, there is a thing called global query filters, which you can um, use in a t couple of ways. I've built a big um, multi-tenant system for a, a com company, and the query, I use query filters so to um, separate off. So a, a multi-tenant system is like GitHub or something like that. So um, each uh, company logs in and they have their own slice of that data. And you can use query filters to do that really, really well, right? Um, and, it, and the idea is they can only access their data and they can't see anything else. And query filters are brilliant for that. The other thing that all my <laughs> users have done is uh, um, implemented soft delete. This is like you, you want to give a delete command to your users but when they come back and say, I deleted something and I, I want it back, you want a way to get it back. And this is what um, soft delete, uh, using a query filter with something like this, that says, if that is true, it won't show the book. So here's a little super simple unit test. Load uh, four books, set soft delete, true, save changes. Count is now three. If I say ignore query filters, it's four. So that book has disappeared. And I can tell you, because I worry about this and I checked it all, um, you can't get in a query, you can't get it with a find, you can't get it with an include. I don't know any way other than going to SQL you can make that appear, or, or this command, right, to make it appear. Right? So it's really good. So it's gone from the users, right? But then when they come and say, oh, please to help me, you know, they go, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll work for hours doing this, set the thing back, it reappears. 
It's lovely. And all my clients have done that. Um, the thing I want to talk about, though, and we're having a, a philosophical discussion with my client. Um, if, you, if you deleted this book for real, the reviews would be deleted as well. It's a cascade delete, because the reviews rely on that book, and they would delete, right? If you soft delete that, the reviews still remain. You haven't soft deleted the reviews. So you've got to be a little bit careful about how you um, access things off the book. There's a, a thing in um, domain-driven design about called root and aggregate. And what, the, what they say is, this is a root, and the, the, um, the reviews are, is an aggregate underneath. And it says you should always go through the root to, to access the aggregate. So if you always uh, try to get the reviews by pulling the book in and then getting the reviews off that, you'll be fine because you will never get that book. Yeah? So just bear that in mind. OK, let's keep going on. Um, Value converters. So these came in in 2.1. It's not a new thing in 3, but I, I really like these. So if the problem I had, if I save a date time to the database and then I pull it back out again, it's lost its, um, its kind. It, it, if it was UTC, it doesn't say it's UTC anymore. And that's a problem if I'm sending JSON to my front end because it hasn't got the Z in it. And that, that was a, before this, I, had to, I did it with backing fields and stuff. But now, uh, you could have this conversion. So this is what you can convert things when it goes out and when it comes back in. So when it goes out, I just send it out. But when it comes back, I add the UCT back. And that is magic. Uh, another thing that the, my current client does, he's quite se uh, SQL-centric, he, he understands you know, he does a lot of things down there. So he stay, saves his enums as strings because they're normally t uh, s uh, saved as numbers. And if, you know, working out it's number seven, uh, it is, you know, um, blow up or something. <laughs> you know, it's, so, uh, and, and what this does is it, send it makes it a string in the database. When it comes back, it turns it back into a Enum. That's, that's really nice. So, um, what's the next one? Oh, yes. I'm always looking for ways to automate things. And my current client, I got pulled in quite late. He's got a massive, he's put all his configuration in his DB context, and it's really long. And there is a way to automate some of your... Um, um, setting up and configuration. So, so here we are. This is the way to do it. it model, biddle, model builder model. You have to use that one, not the one in DB context. Get entity type. That returns like a bit of stuff about the, that class with some stuff from, it, from EF Core. Then I can get all the properties. You can, you can see where I'm going here, don't you? So if it's a date time and it ends with UTC, make it UTC. I have a lot of things saying, you know, created at UTC, updated at UTC. I've got loads of them, and this will just pick all of them up. Um, there are a number of ways you can do that. Um, that's one of them. Unfortunately for the... Um, Soft delete, it's not so simple. Um, you, you can't, there isn't a kind of um, way you can do it. You have to create, uh, dynamically create a like, little config uh, class of the right type. And this guy um, on Stack Overflow, filter all queries, trying to achieve soft delete, have done it. And he's got a little bit of code uh, which you can. You can see I'm going in the same, same, going through them all. If it's got an I soft delete type on it, then set the 
the query filters. That is quicker and more secure, right? You don't want to have a soft delete that hasn't be got, been set properly. So that is a good um, approach. Um, Cosmos DB. This is a bit of code from uh, a Cosmos DB um, test I did. Um, in my book, I started with 50 books at the beginning. In chapter 13, I went up to 100,000 books and a half a million reviews. And guess what? The sequel was slow, right? Because <laughs> it's, it's doing a lot of work. And I performance tuned that. And then in chapter 14, I built this. This is a CQRS uh, pattern. I had a SQL uh, database, and I had a NoSQL database um, where you, you uh, worked out all the data, put it on there, and it comes out um, kind of already pre-baked. Um, I, I rebuilt this with Cosmos DB, and it's lovely, right? Um, and the idea is to, um, you know, I, I, in my book, I went up to half a million books um, with uh, RavenDB, and it was just, it was just, yeah, it's fine. You know, it's like, it's fine. It was, it was really, really, really fast. Um, and this, I haven't totally timed it because I've got a whole, of a, a whole other set of stuff that I'm doing along with it but it's looking like it will be uh, just as quick. Um, so in doing that, I spent a lot of time looking at Cosmos DB in EF Call 3. And if you go to my site, there's a, uh, if, if you go to my site and then go to uh, NoSQL as you know, one of the categories, you'll find this. And I, and I found all sorts of interesting things about, about Cosmos DB and about EF Core's um, um, setup. For instance, counting the number of books is a very costly thing with Cosmos DB. You don't want to do it, right? Um, and there were some things that were broke, uh, broken in, um, in um, EF Core and some limitations that they haven't dealt with yet. Um, I think it's, Cosmos DB is fine, but one of the things you can't, at the moment, you can, I can have a Cosmos DB and I can um, put in the reviews inside that. But what I can't do is have a Cosmos DB, uh, a Cosmos book and a Cosmos reviews and have a relation be between them. And they, and, and they say it's going to change but it doesn't look like it's going to change in five, so I don't know what's going on. But, um, so it, Cosmos DB is, is there, it's, it's good, but there are some limitations. Like they haven't done all the aggregates, so you can't do the aggregates. So you can't count, you can't sum, things like that. There's, you know, there's things there, so just be, be aware of that. Okay. Oh. Oh, right. Yes. Black slide. Um, I, I do uh, unit test my code using real database. And a, a lot of people say, no, you shouldn't do that. You should, for, you should mock it out and all that sort of stuff. So um, that's fine. But um, when, you, you went, when you go from version 2 to version 3 of EF Core, um, my client had a lot of things broken and they, because he didn't unit test them. I had, uh, because I knew of this problem really early on, um, it was all about client versus server and all that sort of stuff, I built a library and I, check, I checked that. So all my code worked, went to 3 fine. But my client, you know, it was, there were lots of places where it couldn't translate it. If he'd unit tested those code, then he would have found that. So what I'm saying is, people say, oh, you don't need to test EF Core. No, you don't, but you do need to test your use of EF Core, and I make lots of mistakes, right? I love unit tests, right? 
And so I, I test it. So how can you do it well? So the first thing, if you're using really standard EF core, you're not using any set special things in your database, you're not using user-defined functions or computed columns and things like that, you can use a SQL in-memory database. And it's, it's very quick, and it's empty when you get it, and it's just for this test, right? So it's really good. So if you can, if, if you're working that way, if you're doing something you, in the database that is more complicated, you can't use this because it, it just won't work. But um, I use SQLite because it, it checks all my references. If I, it'll tell me if I, you know, if I do something wrong with some, because uh, um, it's, it's taking, checking the, the, the integrity of the database. Um, and so I have um, a library, and I've just, that the code in the last, te uh, the, the last slide was what I've got. Um, and what, the other thing that helps you is that um, EF Core has this command, context database in ensure created. It's meant for unit tests. And what it says, it, nothing about migration, it just says, what are your classes look, looking like now? What should the database, I'll make a database exactly the right, like that, right? So it's gonna be exactly what you have at the moment. And then you could, and it's empty, so you can you know, do stuff, whatever, right? Um, so that's really, that's really good, and I recommend it. Um, if you don't, it gets a bit more complicated, right? Um, you have to, this is in my library, I create a unique, a unique um, database name off the class. I give, I put in class. So, because, uh, let's not talk about the, the, my code, let's talk about the problem. If you're running uni, unit tests, I'm using XUnit, which most people uh, um, like EF Call use it. Um, it runs all your unit tests in parallel, or it can run all its units. Yeah. So if, if you, you can't have one database being used by all your unit tests. So this one made, makes it unique to the class. Uh, you, I've also got one for making it unique to a method, but all I'm doing is changing the name of the, of the database. And then you have the problem that the database may have been used before, so it's got data in it, so you've got to deal with it. I've got one way of doing it. There are the, 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 the def, de, definitive way to do it is delete the database and, and recreate it, but it takes about eight or 10 seconds, and that slows down you know, your, all your unit tests, and I don't like that. So I try to work, do things to get around that. Okay? Um, and we're nearly there. Um, how are we doing? Yeah, good. Um, I'm thinking of, this is the end, by the way. Um, I'm thinking of writing some articles around the things I've put in this, um, in this talk. And I would like your advice on what you thought was good, bad, you know, what didn't understand, whatever, and I'll, I'll try and then do it. I'm, I'm, I'm a working you know, contractor, so it won't come out like, like that, but um, you know, I'd like, like to talk about that. Uh, so, and I've got six minutes for any questions. Sir? Where do you stand on code first and migrations? Um, okay, um, most people work you, you, you mostly, hmm. it depends. Um, for me, I, I use code first and I have a, a, a uh, I've built something in my test support which will map, which will compare the, um, the classes, what the, what EF Core thinks 
the, the classes look like from the config and the database. So it, it will tell me how they differ. And then I build um, scripts to update the database. I don't use migrations. But I'm a bit you know, nerdy, and I, you know, I'm going to do that. And I, you know, so I don't use migrations. My current um, client uses migrations. Yeah. Curious, it appear to have been, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you afterwards because I've got a, a big um, two blogs on my, doing migrations and all that sort of stuff. Anybody else? Sir? Yeah, I know some of, a lot of your examples were just like kind of uh, two list or like save changes. Do you, do you tend to just go with the synchronous or was that just for simplicity? Oh, no, si that's, that's, for, that's for simplicity. Okay, yeah. yeah. So, so, you are using so all my unit tests, I I try not to use async yeah. because I don't mind in my unit tests and debugging async is a little bit more harder. But of course, I'm, I'll have method in there. But in in the the main stuff, I I use async a lot. I don't use it absolutely everywhere. Um, there are some places where a really small query is quicker sync, right? Okay, could you give an example of that? So if you're loading a very small thing using the primary key, then I might, I might use um, sync, right? Oh, and another techie thing, I only learned this. Um, I thought find is the right way to load an entity. Um, it, it's okay, but um, single uh, or default off a primary key is twice as fast. All right? So worth knowing that. Um, and it's because the, the, the find is looking in the local DB context, I think. So it's a bit slower. So. Um, what's the like you wait for doing bulk updates or deletes if I have a lot, uh, yeah. a big list of deletes or updates? Yeah, I wouldn't say that EF Core is great for big updates. Um, if you've got just one thing with no relationships, which I never have, I'm, I'm normally saving great chunks of things, um, then there are... Um, Libraries that will do that much quicker, right? Um, EF Core is better than EF6 at um, uh, bulk load. Um, on delete, I'm, I haven't timed delete. To, I think deletes aren't too bad. Or have you found that a bit? Well, well the problem was I had to, to load. So I have a condition. I don't want to leave my whole table. Yeah? Yeah. So I have to preload the entities. Or just generate the or just the primary keys. I have to pre-select them and then send the delete. Yeah. So you you can delete things just by creating uh, a the entity with just the primary key. Right, but I still you still got to get them. Round yeah, yeah. To the database. So yeah. yeah. Anyway, I think one more minute, sir. Um, so if you if you're struggling with EF Core not generating um, well performing uh, SQL yeah. statements, do you ever resort to either views or store procedures? Yeah, uh, and so in, in my book, so going to Dapper, right, absolutely fine, right? Um, EF Core is good, but it's not perfect. So, um, you know, you, you use EF Core because it's quick to build, right? And then, when you get a problem, you, you decide what you're going to do. And, and going to Dapper um, could be a very good decision. What I would say, I've found that for big um, act, um, queries that do a lot, Dapper is not that faster unless you've got some better SQL to put in there. Because Dapper's really quick because it, it you know, because it, 
it, it's so small, but when the, all the time is taken in the database, it doesn't make much difference. Yeah? Anyway, I think that's it. Thank you very much.